Yeah, the hood's back off. Hey there, welcome back to Farmcraft. I'm John. And I was just getting ready to put this thing back in action. And uh, I would have, except for you guys, started giving me some really good ideas on additional things that I need to check. And thank you for that. Yeah, it's funny, when you get a new piece of equipment and you're working through it, you really, you really kind of want to get out and use it. But there's a few more things that I really should do here before we start really pushing some dirt around with it. Uh, because I don't want to cause any problems. I want it to work and continue to work. Hopefully that's the plan. So first thing I'm going to do, uh, I do want to adjust the valves and many of you pointed out and I knew this, I was kind of cutting corners. I didn't put a spacer in here. So now when I'm squeezing that bolt down, I'm actually kind of bending this bracket a little bit and I'm not able to bolt it properly. So I'm going to machine a spacer for that and uh, we're going to adjust the valves. We'll start out with those two things. Looks like 1.2 would be good. I either hit a hard spot or that bit needs to be sharpened. That's a little better. we go. All right, yeah, that's a lot better. So now rather than just like compressing those two pieces of metal, I'm actually, it's a hard stop there. So I've got that torqued down much better. And you know, while I'm here, uh, several people pointed out that my parasitic draw might be right here. I have battery voltage at this post. Now this is the field winding. This generates the magnetic field. So when you start spinning this, it's rotating in a magnetic field. I went through all this in my how generators work. Well, it's much the same with an alternator. So this field winding here is constantly being energized because there's no switch. This doesn't get voltage when the machine is turned on. It always has voltage. Yeah, so from here to here, energizing that field winding is four milliamps. And that's exactly what I saw uh, when I did the, the same thing over at the battery, it's drawing four milliamps. So that means I need to energize the field winding with a switched wire. So let's see what we can do about that. All right, so quick review of the wiring in this thing. From the battery, which is under the seat, it sends a big cable forward to right here. That's the starter. And then coming off the starter, there's a, a red wire that goes into the console. It's right there and it comes over to the breaker down here and then it goes over to the amp meter right there after coming through the amp meter it comes over to here and that sends power to various things one of the big things it sends power to is the oil pressure switch so this connection is made when the oil pressure is up in other words when the engine's running this right here is going to have power and that's what i hooked my hour meter to that basically is your ignition on so that's what i need to hook the field winding to uh, in the alternator i had a wire in here 
it's this one right here that uh, I wasn't using for anything. And uh, I think it was used in the old style alternator. Well, I'm going to use it again. So it goes through the, the firewall there. Comes out here of a harness and then goes right back into a harness. Comes down here by the battery and it turns out it's this one. You can see it's it went from brown to green right there. And when I test the ohms here, now let's do it to lead. But uh, wow, that's 29 kilo ohms. I definitely have a bad connection somewhere in this wire. Exposed copper right here. Still kilo ohms. That's no good. All right, so that eliminates the, the whole green wire splice. Let's see if that made any difference. 30 kilo ohms. 0.5 ohms when I check on the other side. So it's not the meter. It is the wire in some way, shape, or form. All right, I'm going to have to run a new wire. That's what that means. Aaron takes in my way, and it's going to be in my way for the valves too. So let's get this out of here. Looks pretty clean. Let's keep it that way. Now, as far as wire, I have limited options, but I have this stuff. I actually pulled this off of my dump truck. It used to be involved in controlling a plow that I'm never gonna use again and don't have. So I took the wiring off, but it's in good shape. So this is a sheathed three wire. They're copper stranded. You know, it's made for automotive. Yeah, it's got this nice protection on it. I only need one wire, but I've got this stuff and it's free, so let's use it. When I was working on this last time, many of you pointed out, and I thought of it too after the fact, that I shouldn't have left this wire bare. This wire had been connected here. The other end of it, it wasn't connected to anything, so I just disconnected it and left it here. Well, in this console, we've got several connections that are just hot all the time. This is a direct to battery connection. So are both of these. Um, I mean, there's a breaker in between, but it's a, it's a huge amperage breaker. Uh, you don't really want things to be able to just potentially short out and just leaving this ring terminal exposed in there. It could, you know, rattle around and then end up shorting against something. So let's get rid of that. In fact, I'll shorten it a little bit. I don't ever plan on using this wire again, but um, it's in a harness. It would actually be kind of hard to actually remove it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually put a butt connector on it. And that does two things. This isn't technically correct because you could still potentially short out a butt connector, but it's pretty unlikely because you have to reach down inside there to touch the, the metal. So this does serve to protect the wire pretty well. So yeah, I mean, now that can even flop up against any of these connections. It's just not gonna make a connection. But if anyone ever wants to do anything with this wire, they've got a butt connector right there. You can reach your meter down in there, use it to trace the wire, figure out what's going on, whatnot. So I'm just gonna tuck that down underneath like that, and that'll be just fine. Now, this is our new wire. So let's strip that back. So I don't know if folks will agree or not, but to me, when I see a wire where the ends are tied up like that, that just tells me that they're available to be used at the other end. I know you're jealous of my screwdriver.
So now the field winding is only going to be powered when the engine is running. That ought to do it. And man, I don't know if it comes across on camera. This is all the smoke from those wildfires in, I think it's Ontario, up in Canada. I mean, it is just, I, yeah, it is so hazy out here. And I think it's actually getting to me a little bit. It's making me cough. Pleasant. So here you can see my wiring job. Comes down, a couple of zip ties, pretty much follows the other harness, and then comes right around with the power wire that was going over to the alternator. And then this is the power wire again on this side. It just goes to the post now, and then this zip tied to it comes and creates the field so that it'll work. Now you might ask why I didn't just go straight from the firewall, straight shot over to the alternator. Well, it's because of all of this. It's good practice to follow the existing harness, and the reason the harness is over there because this is going to get hot and burnt wires. You know, I uh, probably could have snaked it back around and then come back up, but what's the point? Just keep it simple. All right, let's check our parasitic draw. We're going to amps. This is the negative cable to the rest of the machine. And then here's our negative battery. And we have no amps. Parasitic draw is eliminated. That's nice. I'm happy about that. All right, so we are gonna adjust the valves. They're behind the valve cover right there. I'll go to the other side in a second. But uh, first, I wanna get the engine in the right position. Now down here, this is the transmission cover. That's where the flywheel is behind this plug. Uh, what they tell me is that you can take that plug out and put a bolt in there, and there will be a hole on the flywheel that will match up with that bolt to put the engine in the right position to check the valves. I am going to be using a wrench on the crankshaft bolt right there to just turn the engine by hand until I can get this flywheel in the right position. In one position, you check three of the valves. You know, there's three cylinders, so there's two valves on each cylinder, six total. And then once you've checked those three, then you rotate the engine 360 degrees and check the other three. So I've already loosened this plug, so let's go ahead and take that out. Say so just take a 3 8 bolt, stick it in there. So I'm probably hitting the flywheel right now, and I'm going to bar the engine over until I can get that to push in. Yeah, I can feel it sliding on that bolt. I really wish I could use a socket for this and be able to just ratchet it, but there's not room. There, it just went in. Yep, that's in the flywheel. So, let's get this valve cover off. Now a big part, I mean the valves need to be adjusted, but a big part of why I'm doing this is because of the hard starting. Now several people commented that I should just use the glow plugs and not worry about it. And I don't really disagree with that. I'm fine with using the glow plugs, but even the manual says that if the temperature is above 60, you shouldn't need them. And then under 60, like from 30 to 60 or something, you should only need a few seconds. So it's definitely not doing what the manual says it should do. Now, it's an old machine and the engine's got wear and maybe it's just not going to. But it also tells me that there might be something wrong, like the valves are out of adjustment. So if I can fix it, then I will. So that's my thinking. Different size bolts, of course because why wouldn't they be?
There we go. Yeah, so like I said, it's a four cylinder. <laughs> I don't know why I thought it was three. Um, obviously there's four uh, fuel lines right there. I think pretty sure my tractor's three, but anyway. What we have here are intake valves right here and then the exhaust valves are these. Basically the intake valves are in the pair. The intake is closest to the fan, the exhaust is closest to the transmission. So the intake is supposed to be 15 thousandths and the exhaust is supposed to be 25. Now I've got the engine in position, but I don't know which valves are which to check. So those aren't loose, that's not loose. That one is. So four of them should be loose. That one's loose, that one's not. That is, and that is. Okay, so those are the four that we check. And nothing feels crazy sloppy so far, so let's do the intake valves, this one. Yeah, that actually feels really good. Okay, that one's loose. Uh, that one's a little loose. Not much though. And that's the only two intake valves I can do. So exhaust. That's a little loose. Also a little loose. So yeah, the way you adjust these, you loosen the jam nut and then you just use a screwdriver, turn it in, get the, uh, the drag so that it's good, and then tighten the jam nut. So let's get that done. So by the way, this is where the electric comes in for the glow plugs, goes through this rail here, and then each cylinder has its own glow plug wire. And then those are your injectors coming from your fuel lines, obviously. So I've got my 15 thousandths feeler gauge here. And we'll crack this jam nut loose. I mean, that feels pretty good right there. So I'm curious if 16 will fit. I don't think it will. Not that it has to be that precise, but... No, 16 will fit. Easier than I expected. What in the world? Boy, if you hold it tilted at all, it makes it feel tight when it's not. So these things might not be adjusted as well as I thought they were. Yeah, there we go. 16 really won't go in there. So that's perfect. Fifteen goes in. Sixteen is too tight. So then I did the exhaust valves at 25 thousandths, basically the same procedure. Reviewing the footage, it looks like I'm tightening each one about one eighth to one quarter turn on the adjustment screw. They really weren't that bad. And just to make sure, I'm just going to put a little tick on these four just to verify that they are doing what I expect them to do. Those should all be tight when I rotate the engine 360 degrees, which I'm about to do. Okay, so these should be tight, and they are, and these should be loose. 
That's what we want. Same procedure on adjusting these valves. I'm just gonna show you the results. Look at this valve here. It advanced about an eighth of a turn. This one needed even a little less. This intake valve was the worst of the bunch. It needed to be tightened almost a full turn. All of them were loose, but this one was by far the worst. And this last one was just a quarter turn. So the valves are done. Now the torque spec is six to 10 foot pounds. So call that eight foot pounds, comes out to 84 inch pounds. And I'm going to run through those one more time. Okie doke. All right, I put the air intake back on. So don't forget to take this bolt out of the flywheel. All right, now for adjusting tracks, you lay a straight edge and you measure how much sag you have in the center. And they're saying it's supposed to be an inch and a half to two inches. And I'm at just under an inch, so we need to loosen that up a little bit. So that's where you extend the track adjuster. You're supposed to loosen that to let the grease out. So let's see how this goes. Oh, wow, wasn't that tight? Yeah, and there, the grease is coming out right there. Well, there's an inch and a half. Easy enough. Now I'm going to have to operate it and check that again. Uh, but let's go do the other side. What do you think that 23 to 30 that was written on this thing when I got it means? I'd like to think it's 23 to 30,000. <laughs> but I know it's not. <laughs> yeah, so another thing I did at uh, a lot of people's suggestion is to add a seat belt. This thing has a nice, real stout roll cage on it, but if you get ejected, it isn't gonna help you. In fact, it's probably what's gonna squish you. So I'm gonna keep my butt in the seat. So one thing several people pointed out, and I see exactly what you were talking about, is that it looked like the governor was loose. I don't know why it does that. That had some kind of shutter effect. That was the, the camera making it look that way. This thing, I mean, I'm pushing really hard here. It is not loose. It uh, it moves with the engine. And when you're in person and it's running, it, it doesn't look like it looked in that video. Governor's good. It's also not leaking anymore. One more thing I need to do before I close this up, and that is fix the water temp gauge. It is just not worth the risk of running this thing without a functioning gauge. You know, you break your radiator hose and you don't notice it and all your coolant floods out and then you overheat your engine just because you didn't have a functional gauge. So, you know, I've looked at the wire. The wire goes all the way to the, uh, where the coolant enters the block. And it's not worth my time to try to troubleshoot this one, I don't think. Uh, this, this gauge doesn't do anything at all. These gauges are plentiful and cheap. So I'm just gonna put a new one on here. So here's the wire coming out of the gauge. It goes through the firewall right there. Comes down through here and goes into the block right here. Not actually the block, but right beside the thermostat. Let's just get rid of this guy. And of course the gauge doesn't want to fit back through the hole. This is supposed to be easy. Yeah, time for a hammer. Apparently there's a whole crowd of people out there who are offended when I use a claw hammer. Worked though, didn't it? I thought this thing was just a copper wire, but maybe it's actually supposed to communicate with the coolant. That thing just sprayed some liquid on me, whatever it was. Probably don't wanna know. See, now I can go ahead and route the new one. There's a new gauge.
Quick! Right, so here's our new water temp wire coming in. These little wires here are just for lights on the gauge, which I don't see myself ever needing. So I'm not going to bother to hook them up. We're ready to take this thing out for a test drive. I want to see if the new water temperature gauge works. I want to see if I can tell any difference with it, with it running with the valves adjusted. And, you know, I also want to see if there's any difference in the starting. Now, I've gotten many questions about the glow plugs, and let's talk about that. So I'm certainly not opposed to using glow plugs, and I will probably use them most of the time when starting this. But, if you look right there, if the temperature is above 60, 16C, you should not need glow plugs to start this thing, at least according to the, the machine. And it's below 60, you know, that it recommends a minute of glow plugs. Now, you know, maybe that's just never been realistic for this engine, and that's a possibility, but I'm using the, the fact that, that it won't start above 60, even when it's like 80, 90 degrees without glow plugs, tells me that something isn't right. So I'm trying to get it as right as I can without going crazy. So fuel injector cleaner, adjust the valves, that kind of thing. I'm not going to put a huge expense into it. I'm not going to add a second battery that's going to cost me $200 every five years just to not use the glow plugs. I'll use the glow plugs, but I want to see if it will do it. If it will do it, then I know that it's running pretty much like it should. If it will not, that, that at least indicates to me that there might be a problem. But I don't plan on taking this glow plug issue much further. I'll just use them. So hopefully that makes uh, a lot of you guys feel better that are saying, why aren't you using the glow plugs? I'm fine with the plugs. But for right now, we're gonna try starting it without them. It wants to. probably use the glow plugs from now on because there's no reason to put that much strain on your starter. So the water temperature gauge is working, the engine oil pressure gauge works, the hour meter works, the amp meter works. The only thing that doesn't work is this transmission oil temp sensor. And one comment in particular, not doing it could have led to the demise of this machine. And uh, man, I hadn't even thought about it, one bit. And now I bet you can see the problem. That is the oil pan for the engine. There's no skid plate under here. This right here is about exactly where, like if you went up over a little rise and then you top center over, you're gonna come down right in that area. And if there was a rock there, it would just break your oil pan. All your oil would come out and you'd probably lock up your engine before you knew what had happened. So uh, yeah. I gotta get something under there and it's gotta be beefy. Two chains supporting the blade plus the, the hydraulics. So the blade's not coming down. So I'm safe to get under there and we're gonna fabricate something to protect that.
Now the other side. If you're wondering, I already ran a bolt through all of these holes and it took the bolt most of the way. It was a pretty long bolt, so it should be all right. Ay, caramba. Now I just ran a tap through that. Why is it? Jeez. Yeah, it's the bolt. All right, I'll go chase those threads too. Okay. So I need to come down four and a half inches because that's up against the drain plug and I'm gonna cut out for that anyway, so I'll have some clearance. That's probably, or do I just go five? So six and a half by 12. Might be time for a new cutter. Oh wow. Yeah, those things get dull and you don't realize they work better than that. This is AR400 so I have to cut it with a plasma cutter. This is just over five inches, and that's the clearance that I need. So now, so what I'm thinking is that's gonna give it a nice little angle, and then after I weld it on, because there's a flat plate that goes all the way underneath this, so then I can tie that together too, so that it'll make a triangle here, and it'll be a lot stronger. You'll see what I'm talking about if it doesn't make sense yet. So that lines up on the oil drain hole. I don't have to take this off to change the oil. Make sure it's actually 
actually on there before you trust it not to fall right on your face. And then once I take this thing off, I'm going to put some ties there to make that into a triangle so this won't, want to, won't be able to twist. It'll be rigid. So there's an angle here between this and this, so I'm going to bolt on a couple more pieces. I'm using AR400. I can't drill it, not reasonably. I'll mess up my tools, so I got to freehand a plasma cut hole through that. It's a nice guide, but it's just a little bit too big. I don't want the hole quite that big. So I'm going to put this bushing in there, and that will push it down just a little bit. First thing I need to do is just get through it, and it's going to throw slag everywhere and probably burn me. work. Watch where that thing goes. That's a fire starter. So you can see, I now need to fill these holes here. And when you have a gap like that, it uh, you know it takes a higher higher technology to deal with it. You need you really need CAD. So that's what we're gonna do. Yeah, if you haven't figured it out yet, CAD is Cardboard Assisted Design. This is cutting edge technology here. It's actually going to work on both sides if you do the mirror image. Now, before I put this on here though, there is a seam right behind it, so I want to weld fully weld that at least to that point and uh, and then tack this on because I'm not going to be able to get it from that side again. got those three bolts in there because I'm not sure how heavy this thing is now. Yeah, I mean, I can lift it. It'd be nice if it wasn't all so hot. <laughs> yeah, work smart, not hard. Be right back.
Now, when I weld this thing, there's a good chance stuff's gonna move around. I'll start out doing some tacks, try to keep everything in position. You know, if it moves, I'm just gonna have to oversize the holes a little bit to get it to line back up. It shouldn't matter. It's not gonna move that much. Not the prettiest thing I've ever made, but that's not going anywhere. If you're curious, this part on cat.com cost See you tomorrow. So that first coat was just the regular POR15, which is not UV resistant. So if it's gonna be getting exposed to light, you're supposed to put a top coat on it. Well, this is their top coat. I'm just gonna put it on the bottom. I know none of this is gonna be getting a lot of UV light, but uh, whatever. I think this area here is gonna take the most beating, so. I'll give it two coats and some UV resistance. That's not going anywhere. Man, I was really worried it was gonna warp. I wasn't that worried. I'd just have to come out here with a grinder and a carbide burr and do some grinding until I could get it to go on. But uh, pretty much all the holes lined up. And a couple were on the edge, but uh, got them all in. I think that's gonna do it. It's nice because this, this, and this are all abrasion resistant steel, and that is too. Uh, that's mild steel, there's a couple pieces of mild steel on it, but the ones that count I made sure were abrasion resistant. So while I was under here, I noticed one more thing, and that is this. You can see that that's been going up and down there and there's a pretty sizable gap right there. And from here, it wouldn't be hard at all. Just unbolt this plate and stick a shim in there. Is that worth doing? I mean, obviously you wouldn't want it tight, tight, 
but I don't see any reason to let it flop around that much. Or maybe that's not hurting anything. I don't know. This side's the same way. Could easily put a quarter inch shim in there and still have plenty of clearance. The good news is it's nowhere close to coming off and this bottom piece um, has plenty of meat left in it so if it's worn a little bit it's not a big deal. I don't know, maybe I just leave it alone. What do you think? I feel a lot better with the way that looks underneath there now. So looking here on the, the outer rail, got the same thing. I mean, that's maybe even a slightly bigger gap. Bottom plate still has plenty left in it. So do I shim that? If so, do I shim the top or the bottom? It'd be much easier to shim the top. I could probably just put a piece of steel in there that's the right size and um, you know leave like an eighth of clearance and then just tack weld it here and maybe even put a little tack over on the other side. It could just sit there and kind of be the wear piece. I just use mild steel. No, you wouldn't want something harder than that because then you're going to wear that out. Yep, same deal. So a couple people said that screen that I was looking for is behind this banjo bolt. This is the bolt that I took off, that rounded bolt that had been chiseled. Quite sure how there would be a screen behind that, but uh, let's see if we can find one. I closed the petcock coming from the fuel tank. Is there a screen under there? Maybe, hang on. Well, not a screen really, but there are some little holes that the fuel has to run through down in there. They look clear, so yeah, maybe that's all it is. Click! Now here's a repair technique that I'm surprised I didn't know about. Uh, one of you commented, thank you very much. You know, I saw this thing and trying to locate a grommet that's going to fit that hole is pretty difficult. I mean, not that it can't be done, but it's just a lot of work for for what? I've got this old piece of fuel line, and uh, I'm a pack rat when it comes to tools and stuff, so I tend to save things like this just in case. Although I had never envisioned this being the use. Like a lot of things I do, not the prettiest thing in the world, but that is a proper grommet. That is not going to come off of there. That's a trick I'll be using in the future. So other than those shims, I don't have anything else to do to this thing. I think I've covered everything I can think of, everything reasonable, and um, I'm ready to put it back in action. Those shims, that would be a, a pretty quick, easy job, I think. And um, the reason I'm not doing it yet is because I'm really not sure you know, how much clearance is it supposed to have? Is, is it gonna cause some kind of negative to tighten that up? Maybe I, I should just leave it alone. So um, there's so many of you guys out there that know way more than I do about this heavy equipment. So let me know if you know the answer to that. Otherwise, the tracks are tracking well and keeping their tension right where they belong now with the, without being too tight. I think the next time you see this dozer, it's gonna be an action on a job site. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. So thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one.